these are claimed too. If you, uh, if you buy from eBay, and you perform the testation fully, it's, you're good to go. So, sounds good, I'll go buy that off eBay. In my case, I actually bought mine in a kind of dodgy little store in Slovenia, right at the outskirts of town, so hopefully uh, this all works. And here's the, here's the UX. So that's my laptop in the background, and that's my tracer in the foreground. And in this case, I'm trying to go send the tracer money. You know, I've sent it all up and I'm trying to go send it money. And what it's doing is letting me verify the address on my computer and verify it on my, or on my ledger. That was all good. You know, I now know that two things are true. But again, let's go back to the interception use case. You know, interception threat. Where did I enter in this address? All right, so I verified that the address is the same on two devices, but I still have to enter it somewhere. Chances are, in most flows, I'm going to enter it into my computer. You know, I'm going to be looking at web browser software on my computer, and that's how I'll be logged into my exchange when I'm buying Bitcoin. Obviously, the bad guys can just go swap it out in the, in the web browser. So it's not clear to me if this actually helps that much. You know, it might help if we use a non-standard user flow. And I've actually told some of my clients to go do this. As an example, you can imagine an exchange where if you want to buy you know, a million Bitcoin, or a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, they would call you up and verify the address twice. But I've nearly never seen this actually implemented. So in this case, you know, it's not actually helping us. We can also think about, again, the reverse scenario. I'm buying something with my ledger. Again, where did the address get put in? It got put in a compromised device. And again, while we have two factors, we're still sending our money to the bad guy. It didn't actually go help us. Now, maybe it does help us in that we're not going to lose the money due to a straight theft. You know, the keys are supposed to be on that device, not on my computer. But you know, you gotta ask, is that even really true? Well, what happens when we take it apart? And for the ledger, this is uh, quite easy. Uh, the device, the back of it just pops right off. Um, and in fact, it even works while it's taken apart, which should really go tell you something. The device itself isn't physically secure in the sense that what you're looking at, you know, what you're interacting with is not a physically secure enclosure. You know, it's running just fine right now, and I was able to successfully put it back together again. And the attacker, of course, can do this too. And since the box isn't sealed, they can also put it back in the box and get a you know hundred dollar shrink wrap machine to go and put the plastic uh, cover back on. No big deal. Well, then, I mean, what are we looking at here? We've got our USB port. Just to the left of it, that black thing is a non-secure microprocessor. And just to the left of that, at the sort of top of it, that's the secure chip. And then finally you get the screen in there, and there's two buttons. Well, what's the computer actually connected to? It's not the secure microprocessor, it's the insecure one. And the secure element that we're, is apparently proving integrity is not actually connected to anything directly. Also, what does it even matter? I mean, what I'm actually interacting with is not a secure piece of hardware, it's a screen. And we can see this a little more clearly if we look at the block diagram. USB host, insecure chip, secure chip, a screen, and some buttons. So, what could I, the bad guy, do with this? Well, why don't I go break open some devices and, for instance, change the insecure chip to maybe compromise your computer over USB. I can certainly do this, assuming your computer is vulnerable, and lots of them are. And you're not going to notice. And the neat thing about this is, hang on a second, I know what type of user is going to use this device. I know it's going to be people with Bitcoins. And that's telling me something very important. This might be worth my while, because I might actually make some money off this attack. Or, you know, maybe I'll rewrite the firmware and when you install it, 
I just make it intercept the, the seed, right? Because when you initialize a ledger, it displays the seed on the screen for you to go right down and back up. Definitely good policy. You, know, you want to have a backup. But that means that an insecure thing, that insecure processor had access to the seed. It can essentially take a, a capture of that and just store it and do whatever it wants with it. You know, you had to interact with insecure hardware to do a secure thing. And maybe sometime I can go exfiltrate that later. Maybe again I could sneak that off on the USB uh, post, you know, on the USB connection. There's lots of ways I could get a seed out. You know, I could even use something in between where maybe there's a partial attack, which say runs a program, say type, you know, something into a web browser to get that seed out. So I've stolen the seed, yet I didn't have to compromise the secure element. And finally, of course, I can also be very clever with the takeover scenario. I mean, let's suppose that I have an attack that can reliably compromise one in 10 computers that your average ledger is hooked to. It's only one in 10, but it's one in 10. Well, why don't I go and make my custom firmware that I've installed on this insecure device? take over the computer and then communicate back to go and acknowledge the fact that, hey, we've actually successfully compromised the device. One out of 10 times I'll succeed and then I you know, run the payload and do something special. But then nine out of 10 times when it fails, well, we just treat it as normal pleasure. You run the normal code, it communicates back and forth with the secure elements and that's that too, because once you open the device, you know, once you've intercepted it, you can do what you want. In fact, why am I even bothering with this MCU at all? Why do, am I limiting myself to assuming that's what's actually in the hardware? Remember, I'm the bad guy. I went to the effort of intercepting packages in transit, so why don't I just get normal ledgers, unsolder the secure element, and then solder it onto a new design of my making? If I do this kind of attack on a reasonably big scale, I can put it whatever hardware I want in it. And again, it gets back to our Doom example. Once you open up the back, you can put whatever you want in there. You know, you're already in a scenario where you're compromised. And finally, let's just talk about software quality. So, if I run, say, a wallet on Bitcoin Core, I've got tons and tons of dedicated programmers looking for bugs. They're not perfect. I mean, there was this uh, minor issue where I inflate bitcoins a few weeks ago, but it eventually did get caught. On the other hand, with someone like Ledger, how many people are actually looking at that code? You know, it's not quite open source. You can kind of see the code, but there's a really community around this. There aren't a group of people developing it. So you kind of go to wonder. And in this case, this is actually very interesting. So here, Ledger's build system was apparently compromised. Or maybe it was just a mistake, we're not quite sure, but somehow a version of the Ledger wallet software got pushed, which replaced all addresses with a single fixed address. Um, in this case, the Ethereum part of the wallet. Now, if I were an attacker, this sounds like a very useful attack. You know, swap out the address with something I control and just take whatever money I can. So you're really going to ask yourself, how did this happen? You know, how is, how did processes fail this badly? I've also heard other examples where in different wallets in Ledger, you know, they brought signing keys to things like DEF CON and other hacker conferences. You know, and I'll admit I kind of anonymize exactly the scenario of it because, uh, well, uh, I'll let the person who told me this, you know, remain anonymous, but this is the kind of issue that doesn't happen. And again, this happens because we're not using main stuff that's all reviewed by a lot of people. We're also going to talk about the, the programming practices on these devices. You know, a lot of the devices, because they're relatively limited, are still stuck on older languages like C to actually do the right code. In this audience, we know that writing new stuff in C is probably not the best idea. You know, I think this particular problem is fixable, but we're not really at the point yet where we're getting good quality on all the wallets out there. Some are better than others. I hear um, Tracer is an example, actually, with Python, 
in most of it. Although I wouldn't necessarily call Python a great language for creating security for the software. But you know, it definitely is an issue. And you definitely have pure eyes on it. So finally, I mean, well, what are the alternatives? And I thought of um, Ryan Lackey actually had a really good point here, which is really about supply chain security. And you've probably heard about the recent alleged supermicro attack where you know, a little grain of rice it was allegedly implanted in motherboards. And I mean, frankly, based on what I know, I'm a little skeptical of that attack. I'm not, I'm not sure Bloomberg got your story right. But it certainly is a plausible attack. And things similar to this have happened. You know, we know for a fact that the NSA has backed towards Cisco Redders because we have the wonderful photos of them opening up the boxes. You know, we know that Supermicro shipped servers with terrible firmware that mysteriously had a downgraded version. Who knows why this happened? But the key thing from our point of view is that we can go hide amongst the crowd. So if you're using hardware that most end users won't be a good compromise target, it provides much less incentives for the bad guys to compromise your supply chain. Well, what does this mean? Well, imagine if instead of buying a uh, ledger, I go buy a Raspberry Pi. All right, what's your average user on Raspberry Pi? It's probably a, a 10 year old learning programming for the first time. They don't exactly have a lot of lunch money to go steal. I mean, in this day and age, maybe they'll be running Lightning on it and running a Bitcoin node, but they're probably not that much money still. It's not a good, good target. Or for that matter, you know, if I have a, a random laptop. Which means, why not use wallets that are actually based on custom software on off-the-shelf hardware? You know, um, Tails is a good example of this, where Tails is a Linux distribution where you can download it, and amongst other things, such as anonymous web browsing, you get an Electrum Bitcoin wallet. You know, if I use Tails, once I get that clean USB disk, Chances are everything else will be clean, and the bad guys won't have any, you know, won't have any opportunity to take over my supply chain. Similarly, while there's a lot of stuff that went wrong, I think in Zcash trusted setup, something I think we did do really well was the hardware we used was just laptops that we went and bought at random computer stores. There's no real opportunity for compromise there. You know, you walk into a store and just buy something. What's the NSA going to be stuck in? You know, agents. In every store to go quickly swap out hardware? No. You know, that's not like it happened. Of course, if you're buying a lot of hardware, this is a different story. You know, the likes of Apple have a very hard time buying a data center worth of hardware without revealing who they are. But for us, it's easy. And with that, thank you. Even though we are assuming no questions. <laughs>